So um, maybe just to start, I'm uh, Martin O'Brien, and I'm the director of an uh, organization that's based here in Belfast called the Social Change Initiative, which works here in Northern Ireland, but also works all over the world on issues to do with equality, um, human rights, migration, peace building. And we work with uh, social change activists and with funders and donors in different parts of the world, helping them to be more effective uh, change makers. That's what we try to do. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be here today and to introduce a friend of mine. We've known each other um, for 30 years, and as he said yesterday, we don't look old enough to have known each other for 30 years, but um, we've been friends for a long time, and um, Martin has a wealth of experience in building and developing uh, housing in New York across the across the city, particularly housing that um, is, is 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 targeted and available for um, people with uh, particular particular needs and um, people who um, maybe need a bit of extra support in terms of and, and so that I think the charm in the U.S. is supported supported housing. Uh, and um, Martin's been, I think it's what, close to somewhere between three and a half and four thousand units that he's been involved in, in developing in the city. Um, Martin's, uh, for a number of years now, been working alongside uh, PPR and the Take Back the City um, campaign around, I suppose, what can be done to. Um, Fix the uh, problem of a, of, a, of a lack of housing, a lack, and, and the, the growing problem of homelessness here in in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, he's been involved in supporting uh, the competition, which uh, you can see the designs for um, around the room. And I think um, there may be being designs have come in from eight different countries, so there's been an international competition uh, to look at options and ideas about how you might um, use the Mackey's site, one particular, this large parcel of land here in the city. Um, so Martin brings a, a kind of interesting perspective uh, to uh, our problem because he has faced um, similar problems and challenges in, in the US and has had quite a bit of success in addressing them. So I suppose it's good to have him here. It's been good to have his input um, because of that different perspective, but also um, because of some of that innovation and ideas. And sometimes by looking at another place, you can get some ideas that help to unstick you in your own place. And I suppose the, 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 the main observation, I think, which um, Martin is coming away with, and he'll say a bit more, is just how broken, if you like, our system for addressing this and for, um, for, for in particular, for producing social housing um, is here. And, and uh, he has some ideas um, about how you go about addressing some of those challenges. Um, so I think I, I won't. Uh, Say any any more than that, but you know, Martin's going to tell us a bit about his experience in New York. Um, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions, and then there's going to be hopefully an opportunity for a bit of a conversation and questions from 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 you. I think the plan is to finish the sort of formal proceedings about a quarter to three, and if we run out of steam before that, we 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 won't we won't prolong it until then. I'm sure we won't, but if we do, so the plan is to finish about a quarter to three, and then hopefully people will, if they can, will take a look at the designs. I think there's an opportunity to vote there as well with a QR code. Have I got that right? So you can you can can do that. But people might want to have a bit of a, a chat further. But um, I think over to you, Martin, and I think you're going to do a little bit of a presentation and. Um, speak from the podium here. Great. Thank you, Martin. And just for the record, I did not use the word broken. No, no, no. I did. <laughs> he did. Um, and I, and I, I appreciate uh, you inviting me here, because I, and I don't take for granted or come thinking that we have solutions, because uh, uh, I do know the seven most feared words in the world are, I'm American, and I'm here to help. So. <laughs> I'm American. I'm not here to help. I'm just here to share. Share. 
So I grew up a little bit more about my background. I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts and moved to New York City in 1989 after university. And I worked in nonprofit organizations for more than 10 years, including um, uh, almost five years running uh, affordable housing and youth development nonprofit organization in, in Brooklyn. And then I formed Dunn Development Corp as a private development entity um, uh, 23 years ago. And I'm a bit unusual that I'm an activist that became a developer, but I became a developer because I saw a need for new models of development in New York City that changed how people uh, thought about and approached affordable and supportive, supportive housing and changed how people uh, live together. And, and Martin mentioned, when I say supportive housing, I mean housing alongside on-site support services that enable people to live independently in mainstream settings. So it can include people with serious and persistent psychiatric disabilities, people with developmental or intellectual abilities, people with uh, substance addictions, um, people with chronic health issues. And in, New in, in, in the US, we differentiate that from housing for homeless where uh, the only need is housing and it's just an economic issue, uh, which, we do, which we do as well. So we've developed 35 separate projects in four of the boroughs of New York City, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, and many of these were multi-building projects. So in total, We've done uh, 36 new construction apartment buildings. We've done 23 new construction townhomes. We've renovated 18 buildings, apartment buildings. We've done one adaptive reuse uh, conversion of a former hospital. And in total, that's 3,367 uh, residential units and 78 buildings, uh, plus more than 100,000 square feet of not, or 9,300 square meters of non-residential space. And many of these uh, were mixed use developments that in included retail or other community spaces, supermarkets, pharmacies, early childhood centers, other types of stores, community art centers, and much more. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through some images of uh, some of our uh, development in general, and then I'm gonna present two case studies, which I think have some relevance to the Mackey site and to the development of social housing on publicly owned land in general. Um, so, our new construction apartment buildings have ranged from uh, three to 12 stories. Um, the, the actual New York City, the structural systems change after four, 12 to 14 stories and affordable housing becomes more cost prohibitive. But I'm gonna show you some building exteriors, some interiors and open space, and, and then some of the non-residential space. So this is a, a, a building in in uh, Ocean Hill uh, in Brooklyn. Um, uh, and a lot of it's gentle density, some of it's higher density. Uh, it, it partly depends on how close to uh, the city center and, and how close to in particular public transportation. So I'm gonna run through these very quickly. That's a, a, a taller building in, in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. This is a project in uh, the Clinton Hill neighborhood of, of, of Brooklyn. It's a very high-end uh, luxury uh, uh, market neighborhood. Uh, this was a series of four buildings along uh, elevated train line in East New York, Brooklyn, where uh, we created a corridor with uh, ground floor uh, storage or community space in each of the buildings. Uh, this is in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Our building is the six-story building with the retail on the ground floor, but everything else around it was a new luxury uh, condominium selling for millions of dollars. Uh, this is a, uh, housing for the elderly in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, these are two new buildings on Madison Avenue in Manhattan. That's a building we did on a, a, a church site. It was a, a Baptist church site uh, in, in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Uh, this is in the Bronx by, uh, along the Harlem River near Yankee Stadium. And these are, some these are examples of buildings we rehabilitated. I'll show you some interiors. Uh, so we tried to make uh, part of our approach in trying to change how people thought about uh, uh, affordable housing, supportive housing, is, is to make it as nice as anything else was being built within our limited budget. So this is an a entrance lobby to uh, a building, and you see artwork, and this is another entrance lobby, and we commissioned, a, that's a, a, a mosaic made of hand-cut glass tiles uh, on the wall there. Another lobby with another commissioned artwork. Uh, that's the very first building I developed as a private developer. And I had, I've been doing this for years as a nonprofit developer, but that's, that's in Bedford Stuyvesant. We also have other amenity spaces. So we have computer rooms for people who don't have computers, where kids can do homework, or people can browse the internet. 
um, community rooms where there can be building events where people can reserve it for private events like uh, birthdays or baby showers, um, just some more amenity spaces. Another example of artwork, we, we really uh, believe in bringing art into people, giving people access to art. So this is another close up of another hand cut glass tile mosaic uh, based on a painting of a local artist. But if you step back and see, it's the whole wall of the lobby. Uh, this was another local artist that did a hand-drawn, uh, that's all done with hand-drawn black ink. Um, and if you get up close, kids go up and close because you look inside the windows and there's other things in the windows and you can look inside the painting in the, on the wall and look in and it's very engaging uh, for the people that live there. Uh, the apartments themselves, we tried to have nice finishes and uh, large windows, that's a living room and a bedroom uh, and a kitchen. Uh, open space is a range of, uh, we try to take advantage of rooftop terraces, uh, although now that we're, we have solar on most of our roofs, we have less opportunities for that, but uh, uh, gardening uh, spaces for uh, resident gardening, a few more pictures of uh, uh, tenant gardening. Uh, children's play areas and other seating areas, places, you know, gathering spaces, there's another uh, rear yard another garden space. And just a few uh, uh, photos of the uh, non-residential. This was a community art center that was a combination of a gallery, uh, could serve as gallery space and also uh, classroom spaces. There's dance classes, music classes for kids and adults. You see a, a painting activity going on. One of the early childhood centers, a, a pharmacy, a restaurant. Um, so now I'm going to, again, I'm going to present uh, two case studies. Um, the first one is uh, called Navy Green, and it's located in Brooklyn, just outside of the Brooklyn Navy Yard on the edge of the Fort Green neighborhood. I'm mentioning neighborhoods only because I know that people have been there, have relatives there. I think, it, I think it is relevant that we develop in a wide diversity of neighborhoods. Um, so this was originally a naval barracks uh, and then the Navy Brig. Uh, and after being decommissioned by the Navy, it was a city jail. Uh, and then uh, the final use was an immigration detention center. And it was known in the neighborhood simply as the Brig. It was eventually demolished in 1994 and then sat vacant for more than 10 years. And after a lot of advocacy by local communities, the city began implementing plans to redevelop the site. And they did something they actually don't often do, uh, and they haven't often done since, but they started by bringing together a diverse group of stakeholders. And it included local homeowner associations and block associations. It included nonprofit organizations that advocated around affordable and developed affordable housing, public housing re residents, homeless uh, activists and homeless organizations, local merchants associations and business organizations, and then elected the elected officials. And it formed a task force that worked together through a community planning process and design stress to, uh, with planners and, and uh, designers and architects that were brought in. And through a series of visioning sessions, a consensus emerged and neighborhood priorities were established, which was for mixed use and mixed income and mixed tenure, uh, including supportive housing uh, for formerly homeless that had uh, that had uh, significant uh, special needs, as well as uh, you know, the mixed use, including uh, com uh, commercial spaces and retail stores. And those sessions established a framework for a competition the city did to award the site to a developer, where everyone who proposed had to respond to the criteria that came out of that uh, community planning process. So my company partnered with another private developer and a local nonprofit uh, affordable housing and community development organization uh, to respond, and our proposal was selected. Uh, the site then had to be rezoned. It was an industrial zone. I'll show you a picture of the site before uh, when it was the brig. That whole center parcel was the original naval barracks and the naval prison. And you can see the surrounding neighborhood was relatively low density across the street. It's hard to tell from the roof, but those were all pri private townhomes. Uh, and then if some one and two story commercial buildings. There was a church and, uh, and some small apartment buildings on the other side and some more townhomes. But it was relatively low density. Uh, and we were looking for significantly uh, more density. And we also had to go through an environmental remediation project, uh, process and uh, constructed the project in phases. So I'm going to show you what the project consists of, and then I'll share some thoughts and, and, and lessons that we learned. So it was, we developed 433 residential units. So 
uh, four apartment buildings and 23 townhomes all surrounding a common green and along the avenue at the end of the block, uh, the commercial quarter, the whole ground floor was, was retail stores. Uh, so it serves a wide mix of incomes and, uh, and housing tenures. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about these as I show the buildings, but uh, there were 14% of the units were those supported, supportive housing units, other rentals, uh, 252 units, and 122 home ownership units. And then by income, the supportive housing units, which were, were, you know, uh, were, were very deeply affordable with services, you didn't have to make any income to be eligible, uh, 59 in the units, other uh, low income, units at a range of incomes, 219. Moderate middle income units are still uh, units that the city and state subsidize, uh, but for, for um, people more towards the middle uh, income range. And then uh, 107 units and then 48 market units. So you'll see that um, we had more ho uh, su homeless supportive units, and that doesn't count all the homeless families that went into the low income rent, the, the rental units, but we had more su homeless supportive units than, than market rate units in, in the project. So this is how uh, the site laid out with uh, taller, uh, buildings on the four corners and the townhouses mid-block, again, with the commercial space al along the avenue uh, and uh, surrounding the common green. So, so that's a view of one side of the site looking down. Um, and uh, it shows, uh, you see there's town, you see lower rise houses in the middle, those are the townhouses. And then at, at one end, it was an eight to 12 story building, at the other end, a six to eight story building. And those were, uh, those were rental units across a range of incomes. There was, e there was four different um, income ranges. That's how it works and it tends to work in the states. Units have an income range that are people eligible for. So if it's a wide range, there was four different income ranges. And if there's four different unit sizes, each building had 12 different, you know, uh, cat, you know uh, or 12 different or 16 different, depending on how many unit sizes. Um, I have another more close up picture. Oh, and the range of incomes in those uh, affordable rentals, the difference from the lowest to highest is a wide range, about 500% difference in income from the lowest subsidized income to the highest subsidized income eligible. Um, this is the, then this uh, building on the next corner is a condominium. So uh, everyone owned their units and 75% were affordable, were subsidized home ownership and 25% were market and that market rate helped uh, cross subsidize the, uh, the affordable home ownership. Um, and if you can see the two corners, the rental and the home ownership look exactly identical. No one from the outside would know which was home ownership and which was rental. And you can see a lobby and the roof terrace. Uh, this is the fourth apartment building. Uh, uh, that, that's the one that includes the on-site supportive services, but it's a mix, it's a mix of people in the building, but the services, uh, the on-site support services are located in that building. Uh, and these are the, the townhouses. Uh, again, 10 on one side of the, one street and 13 on the other side. Um, and these townhouses sold for as much as uh, 2.2, $2.3 million. So you had people that were paying $200 a month for their unit to rent, and there's people that paid several million dollars or more than $2 million to buy their units uh, uh, living together and sharing a community. And they all share this, they all uh, share this common open space, um, which you can see the townhouses, uh, op uh, yards open onto it, each of the buildings open onto it. So besides the, the large grass area, there's a, a children's play area, there's seating and patio areas, and there's a, an association made up of all the buildings, manage the common green and do things to build community events like the one you see in the corner was a, a Halloween event that was both inside the buildings and on the greens where every, to facilitate uh, everyone uh, interacting. Um, so uh, some, some lessons. Uh, unlike many projects in New York City, including many of our own, this one was easy, pretty easy to get all the political approvals. And that had a lot to do with that planning process that happened up front that got broad stakeholder uh, buy-in. And it had a lot to do with the fact that it had many different aspects that appealed to different people and their priorities. What we saw before that, and unfortunately we don't learn our lessons, and what we've seen often after that 
is the different interests are pitted against each other. The people that want uh, more home ownership housing are fighting the people that want low income or fighting the people that want homeless set aside or fighting the people that want uh, uh, space for businesses and commercial development, fighting the people that want open space. Um, and we avoided all that by the, the, and before we were involved, we had to respond to all that. They brought everyone in the room and they hashed it out and, and surprise, it included something for everyone that led to broad support and not, uh, not pitting people against each other. Uh, and so besides uh, getting supported, actually, you know, we think it led to the success of the project um, uh, when, when it was actually uh, built. And there was, not that there wasn't opposition to it, there was plenty of opposition. It's that there was enough people then saying, uh, we support this, even if their support was really drawn in by, by one access, they, they supported it. And so it led to a truly integrated project and community, and it's really then supported a flourishing and growing future uh, for that neighborhood. One of the things we did differently uh, than the other teams competing is that centering around a common green. Uh, and apparently we were the only team uh, that, that uh, proposed that. Everyone else proposed all those components, uh, but they would have been separate, separate yards, separate, so no, no connections between the home ownership and the supportive and the, and the affordable. Um, and uh, there was definitely people that were skeptical of whether that would be a social or programmatic success, and even more people that were skeptical of whether it could be a financial success, and it, and it, was, it was both. Um, which really helped then prove for future projects to prove that integra integration like this could be successful. To have more open green space though, we sought and received a zoning override uh, to override the parking requirements. So we built 433 apartments in New York City with not a single parking space. Um, and we got, by showing the clear trade-offs for that, we got some support for that as well. Again, there was opposition, but we explained it was a direct competition between open space and parking spaces. And to be honest, the per, the, one of the people that would have benefited most from the parking spaces is us as the developer, because we could have sold the market rate units for more because those people wanted the parking spots. The low income and homeless people didn't have cars and they were gonna give up open space. By showing those trade-offs, we were able to drown out the opposition to people that thought cars were uh, more important than housing. Um, but not only was the project successful for itself, but what it, what, what it led to in the, in the neighborhood and other revitalization that, that happened around it, other stores opening, other cafes, and, in, 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 and most importantly, the Navy Yard, which was across the street that wasn't connected to the community, that was gated and closed uh, because of the activation, turned a warehouse that was a million square feet of, inactive, of warehouse storage use into uh, active office space, uh, a tech hub with a 60,000 square foot ground floor food hub. And that was only possible because of the activation of something uh, that, that, was, that was just outside of it. Um, okay, the next project I'm gonna present is called the T Building. And this is, a, a, this is the adaptive re reuse project I mentioned. And it was a beautiful building built in 1938 uh, in Queens, New York in the art, art modern style. At the time, it was an innovative uh, public tuberculosis hospital where they had learned uh, that light and air were the keys to uh, treating people with tuberculosis. So it had very tall ceilings and big windows and balconies all along the front. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a picture of it. Uh, this was before a neighborhood was built around it. It looks like there's nothing there, but uh, you know, uh, 90 years later, there's a whole neighborhood and community uh, built around it. A few more of the historic photos. You see the tall ceilings in the hospital wards. The, the ceilings are four and a half meters tall. The windows are three meters uh, tall. Um, in the lower right, you see what was the hospital kitchen that was later that we've turned into a youth opportunity hub. So the building's 10 stories tall, uh, 22,600 uh, square meters. Uh, after the advances in tuberculosis treatment, the hospital became obsolete. New hospitals were built on the campus and it became mostly vacant and deteriorated. And the city's hospital system, which owned it, wanted to repurpose it to something relevant to the city's healthcare priorities. And so uh, there was talk about assisted living for uh, low-income seniors, uh, and then later uh, supportive housing for homeless or unstably housed people that were high-cost users of the hospital system, which could include people that were literally 
couldn't be discharged from a hospital because there's no appropriate housing and could spend months and months and months uh, in a hospital at, at $1,500 a day because there was no housing. Might sound a little bit like uh, putting people in hotels instead of spending money on housing, but uh, hospitals were, were, were five times that cost. Um, every different proposal for the redevelopment of this building was blocked for, I think, almost 14 years. Um, and maintaining a mostly vacant building was costing the city a lot of money. There was even a campaign as people proposed uh, housing for this site that the neighborhood opposed. Instead of continuing to just fight the, those projects, the, there was a campaign in the community, including the, the elected representatives, to have the building demolished that would end this debate about what it could be turned into. It was a, a neighborhood of mostly two to store, four story buildings. So they thought if they could knock this 10 story building down, no one would ever be able to build more than a few stories and that would end, that would end the discussions. It was mostly home ownership, middle class and white. And a lot of those people were opposed to anything that, as they would say, changed the character of their neighborhood, which for many of them meant they didn't want poor people and they didn't want people of different races. So in 2014, after the most recently designated group trying to develop the site failed, the city invited us in to see if we could come up with something that the community would support, but also met the city hospital system's goals and the city's goals and was financially viable, right? So any, it had to be all three. It couldn't just be, you know, if we got the community, uh, but it didn't meet the city's needs, it didn't happen. And if it wasn't financially viable, it didn't happen. So we looked, and we'd gotten, because of our success in getting other projects that, that were challenging to get through, they thought that uh, they had some hope for us. So we looked at what we could do differently than what others had proposed, and we did a lot of listening to what people were critical about, about the, the, private, the previous proposals. Separate from, we don't want social housing or affordable housing. Uh, uh, and then we incorporated more things into the project uh, both to accomplish what we thought would make a better project, but also to appeal to broader cons uh, constituencies. Uh, because many of the constructive criticisms, obviously, you know, we don't want anything. We don't want these people or those people. You don't have to respond to that. But if there's, to engage people in, 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 in constructive feedback or useful feedback is different. We also did a lot of education about what the housing would be like. People don't know, you know, they have an idea in their head of affordable housing, so sharing pictures and presentation after presentation, it, and it did take several, it took several, it took, well, I said 2014 we were brought in, we opened it this April, so it, it, took, a while, it took a while to get the support and to, to build it, but uh, it was a lot of education. First of all, what this is, and we even rented buses and took people from that neighborhood, uh, including the principal of the school and, and a whole range of constituencies uh, that had been opposed in the past to come see it, see the buildings, talk to neighbors, and see what this really was. We also did a lot of education about um, who actually lived in their neighborhood. Um, uh, because uh, the people actually were very vocal, often didn't know uh, the real demographics of their neighborhood. They tended to be people who owned property and a vested interest and, and had the free time that, that uh, people with, without the childcare or, or multiple jobs didn't have. And they weren't aware when we showed demographic information about who actually lived in the community and what the housing need was in their own community. That was important. We also added more larger units for families. The previous proposals targeting some of the hospital's priorities were a lot of units for single people. And so that reduced the unit count without changing the density. We served just as many people, but it seemed to people uh, like it was lower density and we thought a, a more balanced project. We also did reduce the number of supportive housing units that the city originally wanted. The city was originally proposing as many as 60% of the units, which we, to be honest, we feel is not a, 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 a well-integrated project. It's not how the people in the supportive housing want to live, uh, and, and it's not what communities want, and so we thought we could solve all that. And so we did 37.5% of, uh, of the units, um, uh, which is a very significant percentage, but, uh, but in our view, more balanced. We also added more moderate income units, so still affordable and still social housing, uh, but a wider range of incomes, which again, we think makes a better a project and a, a more integrated and a stronger community. It also helped challenge assumptions about who lives there, and we could talk about what occupations people would have and still uh, need this type of housing and still not be able to afford housing. You can be a nurse and you can't afford housing in New York City. Um, you can be a teacher's assistant and not afford housing in, in New York City. And, and we're serving a whole wider range than that, but it would start to change people's perceptions about 
about who, was, who this was gonna serve. And then we added non-residential space. Uh, we added the youth center, uh, that, that space in the form of hospital kitchen, we couldn't use that for housing anyways. I think some of the previous proposals had it couldn't be storage. Uh, we added a, a large youth opportunity center and we added 12,000 square feet of office space. And that, uh, that meant there was, and that's separate from all the amenity space we had for the building residents. They had separate entrances on the ground floor and it meant there was gonna be uh, more foot traffic or more uses, more jobs for the community, more opportunities for the, the access services for the, for the community, and but also for our residents. So it's a, it was one of those win-wins. And the final thing we did is we engaged with historic preservationists. Uh, they made the mistake when they wanted to knock this building down that they outraged historic mm -hmm. preservationists. We saw them as a potential ally. So we agreed to, uh, to restore it to, his, to federal and state historic standards, which is a much higher standard, much more work, much more time consuming, more expensive, but it accomplished two things. It opened up an avenue of funding for us because we could get his federal and state historic tax credits. While it was a lot more work, it actually made it more financially viable. And we got all those preservationists uh, on board who had been terrified that this architectural gem in their neighborhood was potentially gonna be knocked down uh, because of NIMBYism. Um, so they became very vocal and started pushing for it. So we eventually did get this uh, through and rehabbed it. So the project was uh, 200 uh, residential units, again, in about 22,600 uh, square meters, uh, 75 supportive units, 75 uh, other low-income uh, units, and 50 moderate-income units, plus one live-in superintendent. And then the uh, 800 square meter Youth Opportunity Center, and 12,000 uh, square feet or 1,100 uh, square meters of office space. So this project opened in April. We moved people in from, or finished in April. We moved people in from May to September. Uh, and it's already won three, three awards. It won the New York State Association for Affordable Housing Project of the Year. And it's won two major uh, historic preservation awards. And two weeks ago, the mayor came to the site to announce that the city wanted to replicate this approach on multiple other sites on hospital campuses, uh, and they didn't want it to take eight years. Hmm. Um, I'll show you a few photos, and we'll turn to questions. In the background of this photo, you can see that's the, entr that's the entrance lobby, uh, the historic lobby to the building. It's got terrazzo floors and marble walls. So you see an upper floor elevator landing, the, another picture of the lobby, the historic entrance to the building. Um, just a view of an apartment common area and the balconies. These are all, all the built units on the front have private balconies uh, and a few amenity spaces. So we took things that we had to restore. Or we, so we restored the historic library and there it is on the upper left. We're just about to furnish it, but you see on the lower side what it's gonna look like when we have a, a computer center and, and reading area in that. And this is, a, uh, we have a number of amenity spaces, but there's a game room and again, it's about to be furnished, but on the upper left, you can see a photo of what we just finished and the lower side shows uh, you know, when, it's, when it's gonna be furnished, uh, rendering of when it's gonna be furnished. Uh, and then a few pictures of uh, the Youth Opportunity Center built in the old hospital uh, kitchen. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and turn to questions. Thanks very much, Martin. So uh, thank you very much, Martin, and uh, you know, I think that's a, a great example of an illustration of what can be, what can be done. Um, uh, you, you, um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then hopefully people can, can throw in with their own so you can be thinking of them while, uh, while um, we're, we're, we're doing this. Um, in your um, presentation, Martin, you... Um, you, you, you said that you, you know you didn't start out doing this. Um, you, you, you were you were working more on the um, kind of trying to deal with the problem and end of things. Um, what, what motivated you to to start to try to do development yourself? Um, because that's not that's not where you were when I first when I when I first met you. Well, I thought developer was a four-letter word um, and. Oops. If you go on I have yourself, one, you have one yourself. Sorry. I, I thought developer was a four letter word and uh, and uh, and after I ran the non I really learned the business at the at, at the nonprofit youth and housing development group and then I was doing consulting uh, for other nonprofit 
uh, housing developers. And one of my frustrations was how things were very siloed in New York City. And it, 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 at first I thought it was only because that's how the funding works. So we were a neighborhood-based organization and whatever the neighborhood housing need we worked on at the, my nonprofit. So whether that was uh, for the formerly homeless, for people with uh, mental health issues, for elderly, uh, we did home ownership. Um, we did one of the first ha house uh, projects for people with HIV AIDS in New York City. But they were all separate projects. We, you know, the whole building would be people for HIV AIDS. The whole building would be people with psychiatric disabilities, except for senior housing for the elderly, which people felt it was appropriate to do specific. Uh, uh, no one thought in the community that that's how people, it's not how people wanted to, who lived in the building wanted to live, and it's not how people in neighborhoods wanted new buildings to be built. But it was, well, that's the way the government works. They won't mix one funding source, one population. And so then I started, when I was consulting for groups, I wanted people to change that. And, and what I found was I couldn't get any of the groups that worked in one of those silo areas to want to serve a broader group. And they had, I, mean, I wouldn't say they had valid reasons, but I'll tell you the reasons. The groups that worked, let's say someone that's whole mission was to provide mental health related housing. And I'd go to them and say, uh, make half of the units uh, available for uh, families that need affordable housing. Uh, it's, it provides a more mainstream environment. Uh, it's more integrated mainstream setting for your Folks, it'll be more accepted by communities, and they'd say, it, it takes us five years to do a project. If we gave up half the units, we're not serving our constituencies. Uh, I would go to the groups that did the family affordable housing and say, why don't you make half the units available for this homeless special needs population? And they had fear. Uh, they said, well, will the families and our buildings be willing to live next to someone that has a substance abuse problem and, and, uh, and schizophrenia? And there was fear. And so uh, the only reason I became a developer is because I just wanted to show you could do it. And so I, I bought, I bought uh, land sites at city auctions and showed that you could mix, uh, you could mix uh, people together and it would benefit everyone. The people would say, I'm so happy I'm living in an integrated setting. I'm not in a program. Uh, and communities would no longer fight projects that they thought might be homeless supportive because they'd see families coming in and out. And most importantly, we elevated the design. People thought we were building market rate housing and then they didn't care who moved in because it looked like housing that was going to serve the wealthy and they thought it added property values. And so people, so it was to mix people and to change people's view by elevating design and construction. And I never thought it would be, you know, I never thought I'd do that for long term but it's been more than 20 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in, in your presentation, you know, you, you pointed out, uh, you know, how long some of this took. I don't imagine, and you also talked about some of the steps that you had to take to get people to agree and to sort of buy in. Um, what, what lessons do you think what lessons have you drawn from your years of experience about how to go about um, doing something like this? Yeah. Um, and you, you know, what uh, I, I was struck by your comp I'm an American, I'm here to help, um, and how those are the most dreaded words in the world. Um, but you know, what lessons do you think might be relevant? Obviously, this is a very different context, it's a very different place, but what lessons would you say you've pulled together from that, from that work in terms of making a success of this and doing these kind of quite amazing buildings? Yeah, and I'll re-emphasize that uh, uh, every context is, I'm hesitant to give it advice because every context is different and you're dealing with things that we don't deal with and, 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 and vice versa. Uh, you know, but maybe some of the lessons are relevant. The first is, is the, I, I don't, I think I have to tell the people that have been working on this campaign is, is perseverance. And I think there's few meaningful developments that have happened in, uh, in New York City uh, where no wasn't said often and for a long time and people didn't pierce, persevere. And, and you know, ironically, I think, you know, because I, I started out as a, 
as an organizer, there's common traits between organizers and developers. You have, both of them, you have to have persistence. You also have to see things that other people don't see as, as possibilities, right? Organizers are thinking about a future and, and something different than what the options are on the table. It's not A, B, or C. They're saying we want another alternative. Uh, good developers think the same way. They look beyond what's here today. And, and, so, and so I think uh, perseverance. I think, you know, uh, being willing to disrupt, uh, and, I, and I almost hate that term because it's used too often, I think, in, 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 in now uh, everyone's going to disrupt something. But in, 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 the, in the housing space in New York City, things have to be disrupted. The apple carts have to be overturned uh, in some ways upsetting people that have been doing things a certain way for a long time, uh, well-intentioned. It wasn't, it wasn't advancing thing and it wasn't uh, uh, solving the problems. It wasn't moving things forward. So I think you have to be willing to say, you know, there may not be a, a, a model or a mechanism that exists right now to get what you want. You have to, you have to create something new. And I'd say the, the last thing is what you heard me talk about is, is listen and be open and, and be open to incorporating things that, that serve a broader group of people or bring a broader constituency in. Um, uh, because it, it can both make for stronger communities and, and it can uh, and, and bring more support on it. And, and I know, I'm going to speak to one thing in particular that I know, is, I, I believe, is a particular challenge. You know, if, uh, and we've, we've dealt with it as well. We know who, within something we're going to serve, who the people, and New York's a bit different because the city's providing subsidies and support for all these different income ranges and, and different needs. Uh, but if we advocate or only develop for the, the people uh, that are the, 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 you know, the, the most uh, disabilities and other stuff, um, we both won't get the widespread support uh, and, and they wouldn't be integrated settings. And, and I'll tell you from uh, experience, because we've had people come in and without us there do focus, you know, pull people and talk about people very much value being in what they feel are mainstream settings, where they feel they have not been segregated into some type of housing, uh, uh, and it matters to their mental health and their sense of being part of a community. And so it's a reason, it's another reason uh, to do it. So I, if any of those are relevant. Thanks, Martin. And one last one from me. I mean, we're sitting in the room surrounded by these designs for the site, and I think you, you were quite involved in creating the idea for a competition, and you're one of the judges. And can you say a bit about why a competition like this is relevant, what it contributes, what the value of, of doing something like, like this is? Sure, and I'll, I'll talk about competition. Uh, I think what I think the value of a, of a competition, but I'll also mention what I, the value of design. I think one of the real values, and I think particularly you see it among these submissions, is when you have options, you realize this is what really it's about. It's not about, if, you, if one thing was put forward, everyone can pick it apart. Uh, it's too tall, it's, there's not enough open space, there's not enough commercial. It, you can pick everything apart. Uh, but it's left, well, okay, if not that, what would you want? And, and it, it, people, everyone's you know, saying negative. The th great thing about this, it shows, it's really all about trade-offs. It's which options, right? You want, uh, we see this in New York. Uh, we, want, we want lots of housing and lots of open space. Well, so we can build the housing taller, so we can have more open space. No, we don't want tall buildings. Okay, well, which, 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 when you have to make choices, what, which, what are you gonna choose instead of just saying no? And, the, and the, I think the great thing is, uh, instead of just saying we don't want anything on the site, any housing on the site, or we're criticizing any one proposal, it's like if you don't like this one, which one do you like? And which parts of which ones uh, do you like? Because it doesn't have to be one of these. It can be one of these uh, where you go back to the people and say, we like yours, but there was things from other people that they really liked, and, and how can you uh, change yours to have something that's, that's even better. And I think that's a great thing about options and facilitating discussions about trade-offs. The value of design, though, is so important for both the people that are going to live there and how they're going to live. Design can facilitate, 
community and integration where it can facilitate separation and isolation. And I probably don't have to tell people here that. It can also have a lot to do with how it's perceived by, the, by people from the outside. A lot of people look at, uh, at the physical thing and make judgments about what, who lives there and what kind of community life is uh, and not being aware of how rich community life can be in all sorts of places, but also how, what it can lead to in transformation in neighborhoods. So design is so important. And I think uh, in, where, in my context, it was, um, it was minimized with the goal of build as much as you can for the least amount of money. Uh, and that was very short-sighted. It says a lot to the people who are going to live there, what you think about them and what you design. It also says a lot to the people in the surrounding community about how they perceive who's going to live there based on the quality of design. For all those reasons, design matters so much. And having uh, people who are thoughtful about design, and I think a lot of people's response to the, this thing is maybe not about the architecture, but what they see it saying about how people will live together uh, and what it will mean for community. Thanks very much, Martin. I um, want to open it up to the floor and see if there are questions about um, uh, what Martin has said or about the particular challenges that people face here. And I know we've got some people here who have been involved in the campaign around this, but we've also got some people who've been involved in provision of housing and people involved in, in, in local government and, 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 and uh, in other places. So I'm just wondering if there are questions. Maybe we'll take a few if there so there are, and there's a mic to be passed around. So we'll maybe take a couple of questions and then take, say, two or three, and then let Martin respond. So, Mal? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, the, the first question is in relation to the, the brick. Um, and just want to understand how you navigated around that no parking. And I realize you put it as a choice against communal space, which is fantastic. But I'd imagine an absolute connections in this city if we tried to build something of a similar scale with no parking, despite 40% of households in the city not having access to car vans. So how did you get around with that? Um, and then the second one was, I've been on the planning committee at City Council for three years, and often what we hear from developers is viability, viability, viability. Um, and, and the bigger what you're doing and all of those projects just how did you make that viable while also meeting the social need? Um, and, and, and what lessons maybe can we learn from that? Um, I'm really hopeful we'll get our local development plan through next year, which means that certain units over, over a certain number of units, 20% must be social and affordable, and that's a real step forward for Belfast. Um, but we're already here and we're free from developers that, you know, that's a challenge, the viability, so what do we get back that? That's great. One, one more, anybody, and then? Anybody else ready with it? yourself there? Hi. <coughs> Sorry. Um, just a quick question. It was the same um, scheme, the um, navy green scheme. The, I suppose looking at the kind of design of that, I was quite intrigued by the the different scales. So you've got like quite high rise apartments, and then you've got the townhouses in the middle. I was just trying to get a bit of a more idea. The, I mean, I, I think it's good, but I'm just thinking in terms of the uh, sort of viability issue, how apartments, um, obviously better return, I suspect, than the townhouses. How, how did the townhouses come about? Was that purely to try and cater for a specific group of people, or was it something to do with the, the open space to the rear that it have better light, sort of given properties? Um, I know it's something kind of, as we look at how we develop the city centre here, you know, obviously density is quite a, a key concern, you know, pushing that up, but I also um, understand local communities don't necessarily want to live in apartments, so it's kind of that idea, maybe we get inside that. Great. So, um, people could be thinking of others while Martin answers these three, if you remember them. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go, I'll go in reverse, because uh, it's, um, so the dead, so it was a combination of things. It was, it was, uh, it was definitely to address concerns from people that had townhouses across the street. It was also about if you could kind of sell an overall density, right? So if we could sell, it was about, I think the site was two and a half acres, right? So 433 units. Uh, and so if you could sell a certain amount of density, 
how would you organize it so it was most acceptable to the community? So not, you know, could we have done it all seven story, all seven story and get the same density? Yes. Uh, would that be as acceptable to the community? No. Uh, the townhouses, we did, because those, those were unsubsidized market rate, they were actually very economically viable uh, because people at that high end of the market will pay a premium for their own pri uh, private house. Uh, and so it actually, uh, and, and everyone else lives in apartment buildings. And so, um, uh, and so it, 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 it accomplished multiple, multiple things. And for us, there'd been other, there'd been other projects that have been done that centered around uh, common greens like that, that had been big failures. Uh, um, where they weren't uh, mixed and they weren't integrated and, they, and there were social problems and the police wouldn't want to come in and, uh, and you know, they're hiring all these security guards and, and people would say, you can't, you know. And I'd heard, I'd heard that, you can't, you can't do this. And I'd been to visit some of these failed ones. I'd also been to ones uh, that, were, that were all market rate and they were, uh, you know, people thought it was heaven on earth. Kids could go out and, and play with other kids without ever going on the street, right? There's one project in Brooklyn that I happened to go see where all these people had extra deep town, uh, yards because the, uh, it was a, uh, the streets went like this. And in one block, the, it was wider. And everyone took their extra distance in their backyard and, and made a combined space. It was just, you know, informal. You know, 30 homeowners combined the space, so they had their own yards in this common area. And kids would, there was this whole thing, kids would not have to go out on the street. And I thought, when we uh, saw this competition, I had recently been to that, and I said, I know people say you can't do it, and I know you can do it, and we just have to come up with something uh, that's, the, that's the right, that, 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 that works. And again, more homeless supportive units and market rate units, and it works. Uh, uh, and partly the quality of the design mattered. Those townhouses were, real, were really nice. And again, there's other people. We had a really hard time getting bank financing to build the townhouses. Uh, the bank, you know, because will people, will people pay to live in this mixed community? Will they pay to live next to people paying so little? Will they pay this type of money? Um, and we ended up selling them for more than, uh, than people uh, thought we could. Um, but I'll tell you, we wanted to do a taller building uh, at the other end. So we had 12 stories at one end, and we were capped at eight stories at the other end. Across the street, the Navy Yard had a 16-story building, so the people were more comfortable. At the other end was the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, and they were saying, oh, no more than eight stories, it's out of scale. And we said, uh, it's like we're next to the highway. Like, what, who, what do you care? And there was. And so we wanted to be 12, uh, originally we were going to be 12 stories. We proposed 12 stories there and then more townhouses. And then uh, when we had to then reduce townhouses to make those buildings uh, squatter and wider. Um, OK, the parking and viability. Yes. OK. Uh, the parking. Uh, I think when we first put it out there, people thought we were crazy. Um, we're not close to a subway. We're three quarters of a mile, I think, from a subway stop. We're close to buses. We're not super close uh, to the subways. Um, and there was some pretty vocal opposition, I think, from some of the homeowners who thought they wouldn't. Remember, no one else has part, you know, no one who lives, there's no, uh, off-street parking, every townhouse, they park on the street. And the key thing was it's going to be fighting over parking. It's going to be harder for people uh, who live there. There's times when uh, this, if people feel like there's money, it's no object. We'll build an underground parking garage, right? And don't take away open space. Uh, uh, this was after uh, the, uh, the, the kind of recession. Uh, I think we were in like 2009. To, and, and there was, it wasn't a money, no, money is no object. And so it was a very clear trade off. We had a design with parking and we had a design without parking. And I think if it's that clear, uh, it was very hard to vote for the more parking or to not approve it. And so again, I think sometimes, it would, because it was gonna come for a vote. I mean, that, that's 
part of it, right? I think one of the other, let, let, you have to get people at the table to have the discussion. But if it's coming for a vote and you can vote to put cars in, you know, it's open space, you know, open space versus parking spaces, it's a hard, it was a, a, a and all the bike advocates, and it brings, it brought in another constituency. On the, vi on the viability, um, what, one of the things we've shown is that uh, good design doesn't have to cost more than bad design, uh, to be honest. It's more effort. It has to be more thoughtful. I sometimes see stuff and say, my God, could you have cared less? Right? Could you really have, like, you know, could you have, could you have tried less? Uh, and that's partly what it is. I and mean, partly what we wanted to show is that, you know, not that everything's viable, you have to be re realistic and pragmatic, and we've become experts in, in, in things around you know, cost-efficient design, uh, but my, my buildings, uh, we've won more than 40 awards, uh, my buildings uh, on the lower end of the cost of what the city finances. Um, and so we've developed expertise, um, I, I mean, I know more about structural engineering and, and things than I ever wanted to know. Uh, but I learned early on if I wanted to do something nicer and the things you could see, I could be really efficient in the things you couldn't see. Mm -hmm. um, other questions? Yourself? Thanks, Avril. I should say, people have probably noticed, and I should have said this at the start, there is a bit of filming going on because they want to keep a record. If anybody's uneasy about any of that or doesn't want to be captured, if you just let us know, we can take you out. So I should have said that at the outset. You, <laughs> you're, 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 you're included. I'm sorry, yourself? Uh, both, both great questions. On the support of housing, uh, the model is that we provide uh, space on site for uh, staff from you know, human service organizations to provide the services. And partly what makes it work is um, that they have a number of uh, people in the building. And so there's some economies of scale for them to have staff there instead of somewhere else that are coming to serve it. Um, and uh, and so that's the so we don't we don't do it but uh, you know if it's we're doing mental health housing it's a mental health organization will have staff in the building that they receive money from the the the, the, the health organizations um, and you know the interesting thing is I'll talk another t thing about um, you know kind of interests of organizations so we've been doing this for for, for years and I was asked to come speak. Uh, to a group of people about uh, serving people with you know, intellectual or developmental disabilities um, because there's very little independent housing for them. And I was invited to a thing that was a mixture of, of family and, and, and self-advocates and, uh, and, um, and people from government agencies. And they said, why are you, you know, can you help do this? Uh, we have people with some support that have lived in group homes, group settings their entire lives, or they lived with family until their parents became too old to take care of them. Now they're going into an institutional setting because there's not uh, apartments available with, with on-site support. So we said, easy. Well, you know, we can provide eight apartments in a building or you know, uh, to someone, and we uh, and the government agency said, okay, we'll we'll do it. We started going to the service providers. And say we'll give you eight. And and oh, and I talked to I talked to individuals who said I've, my whole life I've wanted to live on my own. I still live in a supervised setting. I'm 45 years old, and so I said e that's easy for us. We'll just uh, set aside the units in our next project. And I started going to the service providers uh, that work with them that provide this housing, and said I can give you eight or ten, you know, apartments for single people. And they said, you know that's. You know, that's a nice offer, but what would really be easier for us if you gave us three bedroom apartments and we put three people in, it's easier for us to provide the services and supervise. And I said, but that's what you already have. That's not what people want to met your people. And they, they're, they're begging for this. And so I had to find a group 
that said, we've always wanted to do this. We never want people to live in these settings. It's just never been possible because we can't afford, we get a certain amount of money towards the housing subsidy and in the free market, we can't afford to put people in independent apartments, but you have a, 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 a rent restricted apartment and so we can. So we've done that in, 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 in 10 projects now, but we had to find the groups that were put in there people they serve first and not the organization first. And, and, and unfortunately, we talked to a lot of groups before we found ones that would do it. Later, when we started to show it was possible, the government agencies started making everyone do it. But early on, uh, the fact that people were saying no to independent housing because it was hard was very discouraging. But then we, you know, we then just doubled down. The way it works, there's, there's different ways that, uh, that subsidized housing works in, 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 in the United States. Originally, it used to be the government built it and managed it. Uh, uh, not a very successful track record, uh, historically. Uh, and we switched to uh, the, the, the main sources of, of financing are, are now tax credit driven that bring in uh, uh, private banks and uh, investors. But the projects have uh, rent and income restrictions. And, and it, what it, the way it tends to work now is that capital sub, all, all projects have a mixture of public and private financing. And the public, the public financing brings in capital subsidies to reduce the mortgage you have to do, but you still have some mortgage um, so you can charge lower rents. And then we have, some of them are lifetime, some are 60 years, some are 50 years, some are 30 years, depending on the funding source how long we have the income, income and rent restrictions. Um, so let's say uh, in a neighborhood, uh, you would have to charge $3,000 a month uh, uh, for, for, to do housing without subsidy, and they want the average rent to be uh, 1,000, ranging from you know, 500 to 1,500, but average 1,000. Uh, we can't support, the, the mortgage we can support with $3,000 is much bigger than the mortgage we can support with $1,000, and they give us capital subsidies to reduce that mortgage into whatever our target range is. So that's the main way. But then for the support of housing, um, the individual, and so then, then we, so we may open a project and say, uh, there's units for people that can afford to pay $500, you know, $800, $1,000, $1,200, $1,500. But then the support of housing, there tends to be a, a, a rental voucher. And so, uh, and, or the group that, the, the nonprofit group gets money to, for the services and housing. And so then they pay the difference between what the individual can pay $100 and they pay the difference for that rent. So it's a, but the main approach now is reducing the capital costs so that the rent generated from the subsidized units can make the project work and cover some level of, of, of debt. And so when you mix a project and you have some, if you're in a neighborhood where you can have higher income units, it, reduce, it can either make you serve people lower or have less subsidy. And then those are the trade-offs, right? Um, does that answer the? Other questions? Mohammed and Desi? Uh, how did you deal with racism issue? How did I? Racism issue. Racism. Um, and that's take Desi's as okay. well. So it's more of a, when you're talking through some of the, the designs there, the, the design decisions, it's clear that you know, there's a process going on there where you're trying to sort of satisfy multiple communities of interest to see it all come together. I'm just wondering about that process and how much kind of democratic input you have from communities into the design process and how you prevent one of those communities from basically exercising the veto and stopping it moving ahead because they're just unsatisfied with um, So r racism, I'm going to I'm gonna try to go in order this time. Uh, I think you have to deal with it head on, you have to call it out. Um, because people want to mask it behind other things, right? And you have to have enough dialogue to get down to it is, again, it's if there's 11 choices and you don't want any of them, why, right? It's Because you can, you can, I mean, you, if you picked any one of these and you put me on the other side, I'd tell you all the things that weren't feasible or what's wrong about the planning, but uh, if I try to tell you every option's wrong, then what are my motives? And I think you just have to get there enough to, to 
uh, for people to see what it is, right? Because uh, eventually people have to say, oh, okay, you've answered all my questions, you've explained anything, I just don't want that, right? And then, okay, so now we don't have to, <laughs> Now we don't have to give you much credence anymore, right? Or, or people say, I don't care, I, my parking spot's more important than someone else's housing. That's, that may or may not, that may be self-interest, but it's still, you get, when you get people to finally say what it is, because you have enough dialogue. Now the challenge is you have to get people to the table, right? Uh, and how do you get people to the table? I know that's one of the challenges here. And you could, I mean, what these designs all, sh what these submissions show you is that the technical capacity, right, the planning capacity to achieve a greenway and housing, right, everyone, they sh all show you can do both, right? So, uh, you know, it shows you can, I think some of these proposals show uh, options for as much as 1,700 units of housing, uh, but they all show how you could fit uh, this, this uh, density on, on the site. And so getting people into the discussion to say what your objections are to different things and, and, and get to it, I think you have, this shows the, 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 the capacity for, for the, this to happen uh, is here. There's times when there's a veto power and there's times when it's just, uh, uh, if, if there's enough negative noise and pe you know, the people that ha have to pull back. And, I, and what we see often is that there's some voices uh, dominate the discussion so much that people think that's the whole opinion of the community. And to be honest, sometimes it happens, we've seen it more recently happen around mixed income things, uh, where, where people are saying 100% of the housing should be below 50% uh, of the median income. And I've been in, uh, I've been in, in, in neighborhoods where people that come and say, uh, hold on, I live here. I'm, I, you know, you see it a lot in, 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 in lower income neighborhoods where kids can't leave their uh, parents' house because there's, they can't afford the market and they make too much for uh, the subsidized. And they'll be, they'll be like, I've been in this neighborhood you know, all these years and someone else is coming in and saying, only serve this level, but what about me? And if they raise it, then people attack them or they say, you know, you, you know, uh, you went to college, you don't have the same need, and they're like, I'm you know, 28, I'm living in my parents, I'm living in my childhood bedroom. What do you, but they're drowned, so I, I think that, uh, and so it happens both the NIMBY people, it happens all the time where one voice is so loud that people then respond as if that's the only voice, and so I think it's always so important to be talking to so many people and trying to be giving voice, even if the, they don't all agree with you, right? Just, to show there's 10 voices, there's 10 different perspectives, not one. Uh, and maybe you can't satisfy all 10, but can you satisfy six or seven? And, uh, but it's, it's, yeah, people drown, people drown out uh, other voices, uh, and then people think, well, that's the, that is the voice. Uh, so amplifying voices, all voices, even if they don't, to be honest, even if they don't agree with you, to show that everyone's, you hear everyone's voices you know, is, is at least being heard, uh, even if, if, if they're not getting their way. Did I miss, a, did I miss one of the parts? I'm just wondering if, if in, just to follow on Mohammed's question, um, I mean, presumably issues of racism have arisen in some of the, 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 the developments that you've been involved in, and are there any particular tactics or insights about, about, about that? Again, I really think it is getting people, getting to the point where people have to name it, and because people, you know, I'm not racist, you know, uh, okay, well, if you're not racist, why don't you want this? Why don't I like the height? Okay, where do you think these people should live? Right, where do you think, where, where do you want it? You know, and so, I think, by the way, if people don't have to gauge in the discussion, then they never have to show it, but, I think when you're in a public process like we often are, uh, if they're not coming to the, to the hearing or to speak, and, and then they, you know, now there's times when things get blocked privately. I'll tell you the, the very first, so when, when I decided I wanted to try to do this private development, I bought a site and I was working with a, um, 
a large, a very prominent uh, 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 church in Bedford Stuyvesant, a Baptist church, uh, and with their, they had a, a human, a, a human service arm, and they were my partner, and they said, we have no, no problem with the public officials. They all know us. They got letters from all of them, like this, right? We had to go through the planning board, though, and I had letters from, we, the church had letters from every elected representative, and um, and the, I think there's three deacons from the church on the, on the local planning board. And so we're, we're, but we hear that behind the scenes, the elected officials say, we can't not support it publicly. We have to give letters, but we don't want this, right? We don't want, uh, we don't want the people with mental illness. We don't want, we have youth aging out of foster care. Uh, we don't want that. And we heard it, right? But the church, the, the, the church is like, we have a lot of, people on this community board, they're not gonna vote this down. So we go, we're all ready for the planning thing. We have our presentation and the head of the land use committee gets up and says the next item on our agenda is gonna be a center for uh, drug dealing, prostitution and crime. And our committee has unanimously voted it down and uh, we, uh, we, we recommend the board votes against it, everyone votes against it, and afterwards the deacons come up to the executive director and say, I thought the project was going to be on the agenda tonight. They said, you just voted it down. Mm -hmm. um, well, the city had just recently been sued by that. The planning board's an arm of the city, and they sued themselves, the city, the planning board of the city sued the city to stop another project that was supportive housing. It took three years to resolve, and the city said, you don't have their support, uh, uh, we're, we're not fighting them again. So I sold that site. And I, you only need, we only need the planning board in certain circumstances. I bought another site three blocks away. And I did it without telling anyone. And, uh, and again, because of, they didn't realize, they thought it was gonna be, when they saw the design going up, they thought it was gonna be market rate housing. And then when we were opening, we didn't want there to be, people, you know, kind of, uh, we didn't want there to be hostility when they saw people moving in. And so uh, there's one progressive representative who said, I'll host an open house when you're ready to move people in to try to build bridges. Uh, and so um, we invited all the people from, you know, religious organizations and block associations and tennis associations in. They didn't care who was going to live there. We wanted, they all wanted to know how they could get applications for the apartments that weren't going to be supportive. And so, and that's not a direct thing, you know, but uh, now I had, we had the ability to do that and, 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 uh, and say, if we're not going to give you a voice because it's a, you know, it's not a reasonable voice and then we're going to change your perceptions. But that's, you know, I mean, that's not a direct answer, but. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Sean, on yourself. So, Mike to Sean. Yeah. Here you go. I mean, my small comment, but there's a question as well. Now, I'm looking at your house, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Now, I am a private writer, and I've seen some flats that are absolutely miserable. But, so, I'm thinking, you have such beautiful design. Do you find that even living, I mean, I, would, I think that's it. If you live in such a gorgeous place, you probably, I would not say automatically, but there's something that lifts you up. Have you, you know, I've only sort of seen an example where people actually, once they get a decent place, really take pride in it, rather than if you live in a dump, you probably end up, well, not doing much for it. And I'm, I'm thinking, does any have these beautiful designs? Surely that must kind of have such an impact on people that they actually can live in a lovely space. It's going to take Sean's. Thank you. And then Sean? Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to <laughs> make sure I'm not going to give us enough on this one, but it's related to the racism, related to the, the, obviously art, the sectarianism, the, the, the nimbyism, basically the whole thing where it's constantly a negotiation and campaigning between people who have phones and people who don't have phones, and the power and the weight constantly seems to be with those who already have a home, well, it's like a you know, a big powerful political force, or a, well, we have local, we, we have 
It's not necessary, but we paramilitary forces dictating policy and where people can live. And we, we, we've a lot of forces of people who have homes telling people who have, don't have homes, sorry, not today, it's too tall, it's too small, there's not enough car. <laughs> the zoning isn't right, the planning isn't right, the finance isn't right. The, and what we've seen over the last decade of campaigning directly with people who don't have homes is that all the vision comes from them. All of the, all of the forward-thinking trajectory for a city to be multicultural, inclusive, and non-segregated, and to deliver homes comes from them. So it's sort of it's great to have people in the room here who build homes only and who you know, plan homes and are involved in the politics of homes, but. Both for you and for, for and thank you very much for everyone for coming. What would bring those people into the room? So some aren't here, um, and some are just consistently not coming in to this context, this conversation about Maggie's. What do you think would bring them into the room in a meaningful and humble way to talk to people who don't have homes about really inspiring visions for a city that can serve us all? Great. Um, so on. on the question of examples, uh, thousands, right? Thousands of examples, and uh, you know that that comment I made, which we say, I say almost every time I talk about the quality of what you build, lots, says a lot to the people who live there. What you think about them, and I've had when I was doing this early on. I mean, uh, Actually, what, you know, I mean, look, there's a role for the private sector and for the and the and, and private expertise in management because we, you know, we uh, manage our pro oversee our properties and and have a financial interest besides the moral my moral, uh, you know, in interest. Uh, but we kill ourselves to make sure they stay high quality because our names on them. And when I go to do something new. I'm judged by how the previous ones I've done have happened, and I can give out, when we did that team building, I gave out a list, you know, people like, well, what have you done for, I, I, I give out a list of every building and address, you go look at them, I've, you know, I, I'll stand behind anything I've done, but I've also been able to make sure they stay uh, well run. But early on, someone said to me, and this is no joke, he said, why are you, someone else has built affordable housing, he said, why are you making these buildings so nice? Those animals are just going to destroy them. Right? And, and I saw what he built, and I thought, if I lived in the stuff you did, I'd destroy it too, because, you know, it's like, it'd be like saying, you know, why are people, you know, uh, you know messing with this prison? Well, because they put them in prison, right? And so you, you, if you tell people you think they're shit, and then you say, why did they graffiti the walls? Why did they do this? You know, as if it's them and not you. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta call that out and then point, see, you know, uh, if people point to these large tower blocks, they were, they were built and designed horrible and maintained horrible, and then you're gonna point to them that, that that's why, you know, as opposed to who, who came up with this. And then when you show, like, um, we have art, and does anyone steal the computers? Why would they steal their own computers? There's no graffiti in the hall. What? If you lived in a nice place, do, do you graffiti your own? Do you ever walk out of your bedroom and your kid put a graffiti on the wall? Who, who destroys their own nice home? People do that when they think they're, they're responding to how someone's treated them, right? But in terms of giving people uh, stable housing that changes lives, I mean, the, 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 amount of, the amount of stories where people, I mean, someone could be out living, you know, not in a hotel or hospital on the street for eight or 10 years, get housing, uh, get back to work and turn their life around. You see it a lot with, uh, you know, with uh, people that didn't have support networks around them when they had a mental health episode or drug addiction and it leads to loss of everything. Um, and one of the other, one of the, you know, one of the things I wasn't aware of that I learned over time is that, you know, I had reasons why I wanted to do more integrated housing. Uh, the model of supportive housing that was happening before I started doing it, even when people were doing it, uh, they converted some of the old ho hotels in Manhattan. So it'd be all studio, all small studio apartments, all for single adults. And then you could, so one of the first prominent ones was like 400 and something units, and they're getting a lot of stuff done. Um, 
But we would start visiting, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd visit people's apartments and I'd see a, uh, a picture on the wall and I'd say, oh, whose kid is that? And they'd say, it's my kid. I, my, the picture's up there because my main goal in recovery is I want to reunite with my kids. And we started asking, you know, how many of the people coming out of single shelters? In one building, 60% of them had kids. Uh, so then you start to say, if you're in a building that has families and, and we'd have a Halloween party, they'd invite their kid, or we'd do an Easter egg hunt, they'd, and they could bring their kids to visit or stay overnight, it was a family building. Would someone let their kid come stay in it if it was 450 rooms uh, for single adults, right? It was almost like a dorm. And then you start to see, you know, uh, uh, how do people act around their neighbors? Like, you know, I, I have two kids in the university and one's out. You put a bunch of kids in the dorm, like, are they worried if they're making noise at night and they're keeping someone else up? Not always so much. But then someone's in a building with uh, families or, you know, they, 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 you know, they act accordingly. Uh, but it's, uh, so, yeah, but the, the, the story is a transformation. And, and again, uh, you know, for the people with developmental disabilities that some, you know, at my age are getting their first apartment and they're just, you know, break down in tears saying I've wanted this my whole life. And um, yeah, but the stories, the stories of, you know, without, without us, housing is the, is, is, is the base in which everything else is built. And, and so without, uh, without that stability, how could you, I mean, who, who, who could do any of the stuff we do in our lives if we don't have stable housing? Um, Sean, I always forget what you say. No, <laughs> no, it's about how do you build, uh, how do you get people? How, yeah, how do you bring people to the table? How do you yeah, bring people to the, I, I what mean, makes it work for a while? Yeah. As you know, organizing, and so you know, if, if, if you got to be persistent and you got to do it, I think sadly sometimes you have to appeal to different people in different ways, and I think you do that, like, you know, spending all the money on hotels and hostels instead of building housing, right? It's, uh, some people care about the moral argument and some people care about the economics. And you have to get past, why are we spending so much money on hotels when we could build building housing? And there's people that say, I don't wanna spend money on either, right? I mean, that's, that is their answer, right? I don't wanna spend money on either. I don't want those choices, right? I don't want, am I gonna, you know, I don't want uh, asylum seekers here, I don't want immigrants here, I don't want poor, you know. But business, you know, most, there's lots of business people and there's lots of people that are paying taxes that know those aren't the, the, neither is not the choice. It's, we can keep doing stuff that's very expensive and is not a solution. So some people you have to go make those economic arguments to, and that can often be people in the, in the business community. So when we've been, in trying to get, you know, funny thing is we've had times when uh, local store owners have opposed uh, affordable housing. Uh, and we'd come in and say, and show them the economic argument. Uh, and we'd say, right now on average, the average, uh, if a standard of affordability in New York is considered you pay 30% of your, uh, your, your monthly income towards housing costs. And if the average person's spending 50%, we could take a project and say there's going to be 150 apartments. If everyone on average is spending 50% of their income on housing, now they're spending 30%. This is the new disposable income they have. And you're a local shop owner. And they're going to spend it. Do you want the people here? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know they had money to spend. And, you know, and then it's like, then they're coming out and saying, we need more customers, right? But, Initially, they're thinking like, well, this is only going to hurt my business, right? Uh, it's sometimes, you know, so appealing to people's self-interest sometimes does it. Appealing to their humanity sometimes does it. And being very visible and making a non-noise and not going away, as you know, uh, is often uh, the solution and putting it in their face, right? If they don't come to the table, you bring the table to them. Uh, and I know you're an organizer, and I, I know you, you know that, but I'll still share my two cents. Great. Any last, last here? No? What time is it?
Okay. Are we out so, of time, or yeah, do we have another minute? We have another minute. If there's something else so, you want to say, no, I say, well, what do you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, don't know your context. I've learned some, but I don't know your context. The folks in you in here that work in this space, what, what, is, what needs to happen uh, for there to be a real discussion about not whether or not you build housing and nappies, but what you build and, and how? Because there's lots of discussions to have once you agree. But people here that work in, in the housing space, what needs to happen? Change the attitude from a feeling of authority. You know what I think is that? Yeah. We found that the homes and authority, no say not money, of complete access. And terms like viability, sustainability doesn't come for them. We have never seen. Uh, a march for hotels in Belfast, and you have to spring up everywhere. How does that happen? Mm. And then people are marching for years and years for a house. You know, we're in the worst crisis since 1969, when this place exploded for the want of housing, the want of equal rights, the want of simple, basic humanity. And that's what we found. If the same paradigm and conditions were applicable to those in developers, you know, maybe they'd start to think, yeah, do we really need one? Or should they accommodate Yeah, yeah. Sorry, what was that? Was that yourself there? Yeah. Which will search your accommodation one of everywhere and one quote up about either. Mm-hmm. For students, yeah. And yourself? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, well, firstly, that I as well don't know the intricacies, but I know a bit about the context of what was happening. Um, but I'm just going to kind of give my point of view from background and the field that I've worked in. Um, I come from an architecture and design background, and I was working as well on like, climate change a lot with local authorities recently. And, uh, starting to work on active travel and cycling and greenways and walking infrastructure. But I, like, just through all those encounters, um, came across a lot of the social housing crises. Uh, I came across climate change crises, ecological crises, and everybody that's trying to fight, to fight for it to deliver on some of the things that we need. <clears throat> and I think there's a lot of inter, um, interlaps between all those. And sometimes maybe just to try to find different ways to approach a fight uh, by meeting different needs, needs that we know um, whether it is uh, people with authorities and whether it is the public that you know need to be met and that could be met through different um, different paths. Like kind of just not you know answering the question like how to bring people to start joining these discussions. I think there is fear of arguments mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. a lot have and I think it is made, you know how do we make the conversation um, the, the conversation encouraging for different people to come by saying that we are going to be discussing different different things that might re reply to local authorities and councils agendas and what they could deliver like part of me would think, and again, I really don't know the background, but part of me would think, just because I was in the field, for example, of ecological conservation and climate change, that maybe they thought they were doing a good thing when we were looking at a piece of brown field and saying it's going to be a park, it's going to have a green lake connectivity, restoring biodiversity. I don't know how could we, from saying, well, actually, we could deliver a social need, why through design, meeting all the things that you also want and start showing kind of these, like we really learn, like I personally think I need to think deeper into like the research and be able to know what are those different needs that are on this side and how do we bring everybody that is being involved in different conversations to actually deliver benefits on the social level and well-being 
Um, this is kind of just generally thinking, mm -hmm. and I would love to talk more mm -hmm. about this to know more. And, and yes, a lot of people should be joining these conversations. Mm -hmm. There's one more thing, Sean. There's been some movements of, uh, you know, to organize young people who don't, don't have, you know, one of the things young people see in the U.S. is they see their parents' generation had opportunities in housing that they absolutely don't have. Um, and, you know, it's one thing if someone has one kid, maybe they take their parents' housing unit, but if there's three kids, um, it's so organizing young people to say, you all have it, don't tell me I can't have what you have. But then employers are always complaining, right? Mm -hmm. We can't attract employees because they can't afford to live here. Mm -hmm. Okay, then get involved in the discussion. Or your options are you keep raising wages and you're less competitive and you're talking about leaving the city. Get, in, uh, get involved in the, the, the discussion. Uh, and so, you know, if you're losing young talents, that's growing up and going to university and not coming back. It's you know it's another thing to either appeal to them or or or, or uh, that loss of them. Why are we losing them and what do we have to change? It's just bringing more. You know, again, I learned a long time ago uh, making just a human rights argument uh, is you know is you always have to make it, but that's not what gets everyone. And we got to use every argument and every tool and every way to pull someone in whether you're pulling them by the ear or you're pulling them by the heart or you're pulling them by the wallet, right? Great. I think that's a good spot to end on. I think Martin's going to be around for a little while, encourage people to eat a sandwich again, have another look at the designs and carry on the conversation. And I'd just like to thank Martin on behalf of everybody for a pretty inspiring and interesting talk. <laughs>